Hello, everyone. Uh, my talk today is roughly about lessons that I've learned uh, through my time at Microsoft. Uh, we're going to do a little Microsoft archaeology here and dig into the history of some, some of the earlier projects um, back in a time well before uh, the Microsoft that you know uh, exists today. Okay, so I came to Microsoft in 1981. Uh, I was employee number 55. Uh, so Microsoft was much smaller than what, what people see today. Microsoft is 100,000 people. Uh, Microsoft was very much a, a small startup then. I mean, it, it was a startup environment, okay? At the time, it really was like a startup. Lots of innovation, lots of creation, lots of hard, hard work. Today, it's a little, it's a little bit different, okay? Microsoft had only about 30, 30 developers, okay, in about seven different projects. I mean, today, you can't even conceive of how many projects Microsoft has. Over time, I wore many hats at Microsoft, okay? I was a individual contributor. I designed large sections of products. I was an architect for, for the file system group at, at the end. Um, I probably wrote a million lines of code, uh, okay? If you think about that, okay, over 25 years, that's only about 200 lines of code a day. So it's not something that, that, that you know, is all that impressive. You know, over 25 years, the integral, t it, it does add up. If you think about all the things that you have to do in your job in terms of meetings and uh, debugging. Actually writing 200 lines of code a day is actually probably something that's, that's, that's reasonable for you. I manage small to mid-sized groups. Okay? They, uh, I hated, I had plenty of opportunities to be a director and to be a vice president. Uh, I hated getting away from being technical. I loved being technical. I loved writing the code, designing the code, and really working with, the, with people. Okay? However, you know, getting your hands dirty is, is important, but also being a technical manager, a technical uh, leader is a great way to leverage your abilities, okay? Uh, you have to have the right set of people who work for you, but it's, it is a, a very powerful way to uh, magnify, you know, what, what, uh, what you can do, okay? Now, um, not only did I, you know, work in, in many different positions, but I worked on many different projects. Fundamentally, fundamentally they were all operating systems or, op or things related to platform software. Uh, I'm a bits and bytes guy. I like, you know, the, the creation at the lowest level of cool function for applications to take advantage. Okay. There are some many lessons that I learned doing this, okay, working at the lowest level. These lessons actually translate, in my experience, all the way up to uh, mobile apps, to web apps, the whole development process is, is, uh, is something that you, can, that you can learn from. It's not just that operating systems are one thing and web apps and games are something different. There's many, many similarities between how you actually build these products and the things you need to think about while you're doing it. Okay. Through all these lessons, there was, only one, there was a common theme. Okay? It all has to do with success. And, I, and I'll talk about success at the end. Okay. But keep success in mind as you, as you listen to this. Okay? In my second year at Microsoft, IBM came to Microsoft and to talk about what was next for DOS. IBM came to talk about what was next for DOS, but not really. It took us a little while to realize that IBM never, ever had a software-only release. Everything that IBM did was tied to a hardware release. Okay, so you have to kind of understand what your, cust how, what your, cust your customer may say one thing, but they really mean something else. Everything at IBM was tied to a particular hardware release. Okay? IBM at the time was, will, was ready to ship a new PC that at the time was going to have a ridiculous amount of storage. Okay? This, this PC was sold to us as you could put all the sources to DOS, all the tools, all the sources to all the tools that we used to build and create DOS, okay? and there would still be more than 90% of the disk left over. It was, okay, it was a massive 10 megabyte hard disk, okay? 10 megabytes. Okay? At the time, that was a whole lot better than 360 kilobytes per disk, which is the largest disk that we had. Okay? Now, IBM wanted DOS to take maximal advantage of this disk, and they were not, not afraid of telling us exactly how to do it. They were treating Microsoft as pretty much a contract programming shop. Okay? And IBM said, we have lots of experience with our mainframes. So they gave us some ideas of how they wanted this 10 megabyte hard disk to be used. Okay? So neither of these items up here are anything that you would ever you, you know, rationally think about as being of benefit to the, to the end user. Okay? But again, they had lots of experience in mainframes. Okay? Now, while the customer IBM, um, hello.
Okay. Now, while the customer is always right, thank you. <laughs> um, not working. Yeah, it's not the blue screen of death. No. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll use the, use the keyboard for a little bit here. Um, now, while the customer is always right, okay, that's the, the big line that people always say, the, the customer does not know what he's right about. That's the more important thing. He's right, but he doesn't know what he's right about. The customer has a problem that he wants fixed. Okay. You, as you know, providing a solution, you have the chance to make a different fix, okay, one that actually is more broadly applicable, more flexible, or more performant for the customer. Okay. This is you know, a way that you can solve a problem that is bigger than what the customer is asking for, take care of the customer, but actually move your product in a more general, positive direction. Okay. Key item in here is when you do this, don't get the customer mad. He's paying your bills. You've got to work with them. So anyway, the, IBM, the requirements from IBM uh, were a bit off. Okay. We brainstormed a little bit. Yep. Click here. We brainstormed a little bit and then came up with a solution that required a fair bit of education for the customer. Okay? Their, their operating system, their mainframes, didn't have, have a, such a thing, but it was something that we're all familiar with today, hierarchical file system. This is what we did. Now, IBM gave us um, really four months of development time to be able to put into DOS a, uh, a new file system, okay? except that we pretty much had to rewrite the existing file system that there was there. We had to double the number of programming interfaces because the current the interfaces that they had were going to be limited only to, you know, effectively the current the current directory, the current folder. Okay, and we had a bunch of ideas on what we needed to do to DOS to make it more generally useful. We held a bunch of brainstorming sessions trying to figure out the relative difficulties um, and and priorities involved. Uh, this helped shape what we wanted to give IBM in addition to the hardware support that they required. When you're working on a product, you're working on your version 0.5 your, or version 0.8, okay, you need to know exactly how your product is going to evolve. Okay? Not in all the, the little details, but you need to understand you know, how, how the first version is going to look, and you need to know how, what the roadmap going beyond it. Okay? Your first version of your product, your V1, cannot be the end of your, of your big innovative ideas. You have to think really hard about where your product needs to go. Okay? As an example, there's a, a company that I, I've uh, advised. When I asked them what their roadmap was, they said, oh, we have a, an online poll for features that our customers can, can, can add in. Okay? An online poll for features is not a roadmap. It's actually a recipe for disaster uh, and, in, and incoherence. Okay? So pretty much, ob obviously, we looked uh, at the time to Unix for inspiration about what we, what we should be able to do in, in, our, in our product. Linux wasn't even thought about yet. Um, uh, but it turns out we couldn't really use any of, any of Unix code, okay? not because of any licensing issues, because GNU wasn't even thought about then, but because there was, um, yeah, click. Uh, DOS had some very severe memory constraints. DOS had to run in 24K of code. Okay? If, you're, if you're technical, okay, that's six pages of, of, of executable code. That's not a lot of space. Okay? So I managed to convince with IBM convinced IBM with several visits to where their development headquarters were in Boca Raton uh, that they needed to do more support than just the hard disk. They needed to take some items off of our sort of our, our, our roadmap. Okay. They accepted a limited set of these, of these features uh, and as long as this, uh, size con these size constraints were observed. Okay. This gave us a chance to um, introduce extra value to the customer quickly but not to really end endanger his schedule or his joint quality. His schedule and his joint quality are really our of paramount importance. We had a schedule that was for four months. We pushed it to six months, okay, which was not actually a pleasant experience because that meant, in their case, delaying a hardware release. That was okay. okay. And we finally shipped this as DOS 2, okay, which for me, this was a, a big shock how successful it was. I was just green out of college. I worked for six months on this product, and it sold hundreds of millions of dollars and made Microsoft hundreds of millions of dollars, and today it's probably... Um, it still is probably more, it has probably been, more copies of it have been sold and used than, than Windows. Like I said, it surprised the heck out of me. No sooner had we finished with, um, with DOS 2 than our customer came back and said, okay, click, we have some new hardware.
okay? A 20 megabyte hard disk, which they acknowledged did not need any operating system changes. You're welcome, IBM. Okay? And a super secret network card. IBM, you know, again, a hardware release driving the software. IBM came to us and said, now, for this network card, we need you to modify your code in the following places and in just the following ways to take advantage of um, some extra software that they were running. And they gave us the exact locations in our code where we needed to have things changed, okay? Those locations were inappropriate and inaccurate, okay? And they gave us these interfaces um, for us to use. And we did not like really how this was actually going to look as a product. We thought this was not going to be very uh, attractive. Okay. The interfaces that they gave us, the programming interfaces, uh, were interesting. They were really, really narrow. It was sort of like a very paranoid uh, Java object-oriented developer had started designing these things. Um, and we asked about the, uh, the, d these interfaces and what was going on in the backside, but IBM thought that was their, their very secret sauce. And they wanted us to um, use only the interfaces. Okay. Now, we were on a tight schedule again okay, and expected to ship in nine months. So they gave us nine months to be able to put all this network support into the product okay, because they had a big hardware announcement. This was going to be the three-year anniversary of the PC. And they, if, if you, I don't know if anyone remembers when, when, this was, uh, when the PC uh, AT was released in 1984. Um, as a matter of fact, I wonder how many of you were even born then. Yeah. Um, Okay, uh, but again, you know, nine months, not a problem. You know, they had this big, big, you know, big, big uh, arrangement. Okay, now at this point, the DOS team was uh, only two of us. Okay, uh, and as good as we were, and we were really pretty good. Okay, doing development between Microsoft and IBM. Okay, the two furthest points on the continental U.S. Okay, uh, was problematic. Okay, they did not give us access to their email system, so we had email. They didn't. We couldn't send mail back and forth. We had to actually have conference calls every day trying to you know, uh, figure things out. And these conference calls would take upwards of two hours. Um, and the very narrow interfaces we had, okay, both programming and uh, email and telephone calls and, and conference calls, even conference calls then were, I think, fairly low bandwidth exchanges of information. Um, progress progress you know, on, on uh, this version of DOS was very, very slow. Okay. Now, here we are, we're, we're working like crazy, with two months to go, with two months before they're supposed to have this big hardware announcement and make lots of you know, big money for IBM. Um, they call us and they give us 130 state error recovery process, 130 states, okay? Most error recoveries that you do when you write your code today has got four or five, but they, this thing had 130, okay? Um, it was not going to be very pretty, okay? The error recovery meant that we had to do things in our code and call new interfaces in their code. It was not going to be um, something that, you know, between the two, two of us, as, as nice as we could make the interfaces, is this 130 state error, uh, error recovery was going to just complicate the product uh, unreasonably. Okay? So we went back to our code okay, and realized that we really couldn't do all this work in the two months that were left. Okay? In fact, we'd have to redo about half of what we'd written already. Okay? So their big hardware release coming up, uh-oh. Uh okay? um, it would take us another, like I said, we'd have to redo what we've done. It would take us another six months to go and stabilize it afterwards because the, the dance we were having to do with their, with their code was so complex. Okay, so we ended up having a conference call with IBM to tell them that you know, we're going to be late by another six months. Okay? This is the way the conference call went. Okay, imagine having vice presidents in a room with a large customer. IBM, you know, was a you know ten billion dollar company. Then Microsoft was a five million dollar company. Talking to this big customer that was paying you lots of money, and you're telling them that their big hardware announcement needs to be put off by six months. There was silence on the phone for a good ten minutes. Okay, you could have dropped a bomb in bomb in Florida, and we wouldn't have known any different. Okay, there was no way around this estimate. This, you know, th there is, you know, we were actually pretty good at doing doing estimates back then. So, um, this the lesson here is that you have to tell the customer the bad news because they had to go and make plans to change their their release schedule for the PCAT. They actually slipped it by six months. Okay, it was a big deal for IBM because they had 
they had you know booked venues for the for the announcement and had manufacturing schedules and actually had promised the product to customers on a particular day. So this is sort of a ripple effect. Okay, even adding people to our to our team, you know, since there were only two of us, adding people to the team wouldn't have helped because we'd have to educate those people on what we were doing. So the lesson that I, I, drew, I drew from here is that you have to communicate your schedules with your stakeholders all the time. As, be as upfront as possible about, about any type of slippage. Don't ever tell people that you're going to be early because you, you never are. But when, you, if you're, when you're going to be late, you have to be honest, have to be upfront. Okay? Your customers are making real big business decisions based on your, what you tell them about when your product is going to be delivered. So the sooner that you can let them know that things are going to be late, the better. Okay. They will appreciate the honesty. They won't like the news, but they'll appreciate the honesty. Okay. So we went back to work. Okay. And it became clear that the interfaces that IBM provided and their documentation were not going to be sufficient for what we did. Um, there were dependencies between, between their products and between the interfaces that were not captured in any of the, any of the documentation that they had given us. Um, uh, and it was pretty clear that some of the bugs that we were working through, there was just no way to solve it. Okay. Locking yourself into a closet and doing textbook types of analysis, this, you know, which a lot of people spend. I've noticed um, many startups, there's, there's some, some class of startups have, have people that sit there and write code right away, which has some issues. Some, some startups will sit there and spend weeks trying to do the perfect design with perfect interfaces. Okay? Doing textbook academic interface design is usually not a good, good, good idea. This is software engineering we're doing here. That means that you need to take each and you need to make practical trade-offs all the time. Okay, there's no oracle that will tell you what one, when one trade-off is better. It's something you just have to get gain by experience. Okay, worse in the in the case in this case here, IBM was designing interfaces for which they had no clients. Okay, they're designing an API that they had no real clients to to use except for us. Uh, but and they'd done all this this design work and they said this is the way it is without having somebody who is actually going to go and test those interfaces. This is a lesson that is going to come back again and again. So I ended up flying to Boca Raton so I could develop side by side with the IBM people. Uh, turns out that the um, IBM developers also wanted to share w with us what was going on behind their interfaces, but their lawyers said that they couldn't do it. So actually that first day that I was in Boca Raton, we went into one of their offices, they closed the door, we pulled out our, our, our laptops and started showing each other the code and working, working through all of the issues. Okay. Turns out that in that first day, we ended up basically understanding what all the problems were, we re-architected the interfaces, we redid a bunch of stuff, and literally within two weeks, okay, we were ready to go and enter the, the final uh, phases of system test. We had solved all the problems. Okay. Uh, within two weeks after that, basically a month after I showed up there, we passed the uh, system test, their big system test uh, QA, and we finally shipped the product. Okay. DOS 3.0 came out. That was the support for the, for the PCAT, which was delayed by six months. Support for the network card, which was uh, 3.1, was, was the six-month delay, and it was a very, another very successful product. Now, at this point, I told Steve Ballmer, everybody knows Steve Ballmer, I told Steve Ballmer that I was tired of working with IBM. They were an incredibly demanding customer, um, and they always wanted to do less in terms of innovative software than what I thought was possible or necessary. Okay, so he said, go to the DOS roadmap, okay, and start working on what was the really big important items. Okay, he'd worry about how to handle IBM. Okay, little did I know at the time that he and Bill Gates were working on a uh, joint development piece of work with IBM on a new version of an operating system that they called New DOS. Okay, so even though I'd asked Steve to work on something that didn't involve IBM, he put me back with IBM. Thank you, Steve. So between the two companies, uh, we working on this thing called New DOS. We put together an architecture to ask, answer a number of questions. Okay, the questions you know were pretty straightforward. Okay, the first one was a really answer was a really easy answer. Okay, we had a small list of requirements. Okay, and we knew who our competitors were. Okay, the Mac, back in the day, and Windows 1.0. Okay, Windows 1.0 really was that ugly. Okay, our second question was a lot more involved. This was the year before the the uh, 386 appeared. Okay, so that the, all the currently shipping machines were based on the, on the Intel 286. Okay, with that was basically had a very interesting programming style. You have no idea how difficult it is 
to program a segmented 16-bit um, operating system. Okay? It's difficult. You had to do all kinds of very unnatural things. Microsoft knew that whatever we built okay, was going to be delivered after the 386 was shipping. So why do we have to limit ourselves for the current set of current pieces of hardware? Okay? Why not design for, the, for what we know is going to be released in three or four years? So we ended up having a meeting with IBM where we pitched the idea that we were going to use this new piece of hardware okay, and, and not design to the legacy stuff. Great story. Um, they replied that they couldn't do this because they had promised to a customer, you know, 100, or excuse me, 10,000 286 based machines. They had one customer that they had sold this to and they were going to deliver them 286 machines. You know, they could have delivered them, they could have changed the chip and given them 386 and the customer would not have known the difference. Okay? Now, Bill Gates, I love the guy. He's in this meeting, he's listening to them, he's doing his rocking back and forth while they're doing it, and he says, wait, okay, we're going to really do development and cramp ourselves, okay, for what, this, these 10,000 machines? That's what, $20 million? Here, let me write you a check, okay? Now, do this in a, in a room full of IBM executives was kind of, you know, kind of uh, a gutsy thing. Uh, the peop people at Microsoft were like, at Bill, um, but turns out that no deal. We ended up having to write this new, new piece of uh, code, um, you know, in, in basically 286 segmented assembler, okay? It was, a business, it was a, quote, business decision, but in point of fact, it was actually a revenue decision for IBM, okay? Don't try to, don't let the current technology, you know, lock you in too much. Be a little innovative, look ahead. Try to figure out what you're going to be doing next, what the hardware is going to be doing next, what your, ex what your environment is going to do next, okay? Don't limit yourself merely to what is existing today, okay? Turns out that what we had, it turns out that by doing that, limiting yourself to you know to a an existing framework, okay, is a long-term tax on your development. You'll be much slower. You'll your product in the end will not be nearly what you what you, you know what it could be, particularly when the next generation of hardware or networking or or um, you know tool support, etc. When that next generation shows up, okay. So it turns out there's also a further problem here, okay. Yeah, there's more than one problem, but, but one, there's only one I'm going to talk about. None of our requirements, none of the constraints that we were working on, okay, ever addressed something extremely critical, which is the customer's assets, okay? We're going to come up with a new operating system. We're designing new API for that operating system that would expose a, a very powerful kernel and a very powerful window, man window managers, okay? Something, you know, all this brand new stuff that we were doing, okay? So what's the issue, okay? We had no requirements at all to use an existing programming model. Okay? We didn't even have any requirements to have a programming model that was like a new, the, any, an existing programming model. So we're coming up with a, new op with a new operating system that was incompatible at every layer. At the binary layer, no existing program would run, all the way to what I call the wetware layer, the brains of um, of the developers, because the developers had to learn something entirely new and create some create applications that were deeply different than what they were using before. Okay, this is not a recipe for success. Okay, to quote Nathan Mervold, that this new DOS, which we ended up being shipped as OS2, this new DOS was just like Windows. Okay, except in every single detail. Okay, every single detail. We spent a lot of time effort on something called smoke and mirrors, which is a little product, a uh, little code name for in something we did inside, we couldn't even make a decent emulation engine that would allow Windows applications to run on OS2. This is not good, okay? The semantics were just that different between the two of them. So we would have a new operating system with no applications, okay? And a developer community with no tools and re that required a lot of, of retraining, okay? This is not a long-term strategy. Okay, so in OS2's case, we broke customers by forcing them to purchase new and expensive applications. We broke the programmer's model by forcing them to re rewrite their applications at a deep, deep level, okay? And the, the bigger view of this is really that you need to understand your constraints early. You need to understand where, you know, how, you know, what you're, uh, what you're working on and what, the f what is going to constrain you in terms of, and limit you in terms of uh, what, you're, uh, how you're, what you're developing and how you're going to develop, okay? You don't need to live entirely within those constraints. You can break some of them, okay? But you need to understand and make a, a valid decision when you are actually breaking those constraints, 
Okay. Now, with all these flawed assumptions and a bad list of constraints in our hands and tied by business and revenue constraints, we decided to you know, plow forward with this, with this product. IBM wanted to know the process for how we were going to do the architecture and, and design. Okay? Well, you know, IBM had lots of experience doing architecture, so they had a process for architecture. Okay? Once we have an architecture, they wanted to do a process for design, how you design the product. Okay? They have a process for that too. They have lots of experience. Okay? Lastly, they wanted a process for development. Okay? They had flowcharts and everything for how you do development. Okay? They have lots of experience doing that. Okay? IBM was a big programming shop. They did you know, developer development with thousands of programmers. Thousands of programmers in 1985. Wow. Um, so once we got into the, into the development, however, since we were working on something that was so radically new, IBM discovered that sometimes they need to revisit the designs, and they needed to have a process for revisiting the designs. Okay? They didn't have one. Okay? And what they ended up coming up with was actually unattractive. Okay? We ended up with a 10-page document that we had to write for every design change. That meant that we had to go and talk to people in QA. We had to talk to, design, to documentation people. We had to talk to people who were selling it to make sure that any design change didn't, you know, wasn't uh, impacted. We had to do... Uh, change te test plans and do test reviews. It, was, it slowed the development down even further. Worse, okay, what they have is they had a one-size-fits-all design, a one-size-that-fits-all project uh, process that was, um, that they were applying to every, pa every phase of this development, okay? It worked for them before, but it was not working for this joint development between Microsoft and, and IBM. Okay. Different teams and different projects. The lesson for this is that different teams and different projects have different needs. Okay. Different people, different environments. Your process needs to be fluid. And process is, is a, you know, your development process, your shipping process, is a very fluid thing. Okay. Process needs to be you know, what you do when you don't have to think. Okay. It covers 90% of what you do during your day, during, your, during your, your, the lifetime of your project. Okay. Save your brain for the important stuff. Okay. Process is a guideline. It's not an absolute set of rules that you must follow. Okay? Processes themselves can change too. It's one of the great learnings of agile development is that any process, any, any, anytime you're working on something and you need to change your process, think a little bit, use your, you know, use your brain for a, a little bit, change the process. It's okay. okay? The fact that you have the two teams working in the same company have different processes, that's okay. okay? So. But despite being process being a guideline, IBM actually had a okay, um, process team that was actually enforcing every step of the way, making sure you had to follow the process. Okay? Ten page forms, a process team, this was not going to be good. The whole point of having a process, and a, in the IBM's case, a process enforcer, is to make sure that developers don't put crap into the product, that they don't you know, do a, a shoddy job of testing or a shoddy job of designing things. Okay? The result is that you end up having a process and enforcement team that slows down 95% of the developers, slowing them down, preventing them from doing good, high-quality work because of 5% of the developers who are perhaps a little less capable than they should be. Okay. My opinion is find those 5% and fire them or give them something else to do. But don't let them go anywhere near the code. Okay. We had a similar experience in, in Windows Vista, okay, a tremendously successful product. Uh, where we hired program managers to improve our process. It makes sense, right? You bring somebody in, study the process, figure out how to make it more, more effective. The program, the program managers were actually adding more steps to the process. Okay, I went to, I went to uh, Jim Alch and the, the VP and said, Jim, take the process improvement team and fire them. They're making it worse. Okay, but you know, he agreed, but he didn't fire them. That's really unfortunate. Um, it turns out that feature branch integrations in, in uh, Vista were taking a week. Okay? Think about that. Okay? You do a feature, you work on it, and it takes you a week to go through all the steps needed to, to put it into the mainline uh, part of the, uh, the tree. Okay? Uh, it, it turns out that um, it's much better not to let these bad people code at all, okay? or hire them if you can possibly help it. Okay? You have to run lean. Okay, small numbers of small, you know, if your development team needs to be small. Okay, sometimes you need to have fewer people than you've got work and you have to spend a little, few more late hours. Don't compromise by hiring people who are less capable. Okay, Get rid of, getting rid of bad code 
is costly. It's expensive. You have to test it. You have to pull it out. You have to rewrite it. Okay. Getting bit rid of bad programmers is even more costly, depending on your, your national environment. Sometimes, I mean, you have to, and union requirements, you may have to pay them, you know, severance. Much better just to not hire them in the first place. Use contractors because those those are a little easy, more easy to uh, to dispose of when they're if they're not working out well. But don't ever compromise your hiring standards. Eventually, we shipped OS2. What we produced was a uh, technically sophisticated and high quality product. I mean, it was it was it took a while before it, before Windows NT actually caught up to that. Windows 3 and 3.1 were not anywhere near as robust and reliable as OS2. Okay, its window manager paradigm is. is back then was pretty novel. It's actually far, support, far more superior than any window manager paradigm that exists today. It's actually you know, really pretty nice. Okay? That's the good news. Okay? It also came out with no applications, no tools, and a big learning curve for the developers. Okay? It ended up being just a huge market failure. After that, the relationship with, between Microsoft and IBM went, went downhill. Okay? And our uh, involvement in OS2 ended in 1991. So I took some time off from doing real mainline development and went with the other architects at Microsoft and tried to figure out where we needed to take OS development. Bill Gates had this vision of information at your fingertips. Okay. So we started working on this, and this is what we actually ended up calling Cairo. So we had this sort of a weird way of co coming up with the name Cairo, but it was, had to do with, you know, we're going to object-oriented world, and it's a new world order, and we ended up calling it Cairo. Okay. For me, Cairo was the biggest technical and management challenge I ever had. And this is something that I felt incredibly good about, incredibly energized about, um, about, about the work that I did intellectually and, and management-wise. I grew, I grew in myself an awful lot over the, the five years or six years I worked on Cairo. But there were lessons to be learned because we made plenty of mistakes. Cairo was a code name. It was intended to be a set of object-oriented extensions that we were going to have for Windows 95 and Windows NT. This, is, this predates even Windows 2000. Okay. It had a number of big pieces, okay? a very flexible and customizable shell, something that was, that, you know, was way, way in advance of everything that people, what people had at the time. We had a directory service. We had Kerberos dis, uh, distri uh, distributed security. We had a distributed namespace file system. Um, we had an object-based file store. It was going to be really, really good. Okay? That's what the intention was, okay? having all these wonderful pieces. At some point, however, the program managers and senior management started talking about Cairo, okay, which is a code name. They started talking about Cairo as a product. Okay. This turns out to be a, a huge mistake. Okay. A product needs a theme. Okay. Everything you do for that product needs to be guided by that theme. Okay. You need to have concrete usage scenarios that map all the, experience, all the experiences that user have to the, every piece of your, of your, of your product. The product is going to solve a user's problems. A feature, okay, a component, is only part of the solution. It's not the product. Okay? A bag of features without a comp any comprehensive scenarios which tie them all together okay, uh, is not a roadmap. Okay? And it's going to re result in a product which is just simply incoherent. Okay? I talked about earlier about this company that had the online pull for features. Their second release of their product was incoherent because it was just a collection of features. Okay? This is very difficult to sell to customers. Okay? If, you, if you tell a customer you've got this feature, this feature, this feature, that's, uh, pretty, that's problematic. Okay? And also being a collection of features too, it's also very difficult to manage. Okay? So now with marketing and senior management full of self-delusion about what Cairo is going to be, we launched into development. With all the emphasis on objects, we decided to use all of these in a nice object-oriented language, which had just recently appeared in the scene, something called C++. Okay. Nathan Mervold, the head of Microsoft Research, had great for, for saying little pithy statements. He said that object-oriented programming is, is, is just like regular programming, but it lets you get a little further into the woods before you get stuck. But you will get stuck. Okay. It's not a, it's not a one way to solve, solve things. Okay. So you know, C++ gets you so far out in the woods, you know, Python and, and other languages get you a little bit further, but you're still going to get stuck. Once we got going, there were a number of features in the language that actually made difficult things more difficult for us. Um, things that seemed like clever tricks for the programmer, like operator overloading and function overloading, um, 
It's cute, it's clever, redefining operators to do something that is you know, interesting for, for you to save you keystrokes really doesn't help the project as a whole because you have to educate other people on it. It may not map up with their model of how to make, make things more efficient. Okay? And worse, when you're writing system software, okay, all the components I described are system software, your job is to, to, when you're writing system software, is to deliver really cool function, okay, but leave as many cycles on the machine as much power left over on the machine for the, end, for the user programs. Okay? You can't consume it all by doing, by doing clever things. So we are very concerned about code quality. Now, here's a, here's a question okay, for the developers out here. Okay? What is the most, single most expensive programming construct? Actually, not programming, but actually syntactic construct in C++. Anybody have an idea? Yes. Big pardon? Templates. Templates. No, no. Actually, actually, in a second you'll see it. it. The single most expensive thing is that. Okay, you look at it and you see it in code and you say, "Oh, it's just the closed brace. That's nothing." Think of all the destructors that get get created and, and executed there. Okay, there's all this hidden code which gets generated. You start adding in structured exception handling and it gets even worse. Okay, we ended up disabling many of the features of C++ for, you know for our development in. Uh, in Windows. We could do that because at the time, you know, Microsoft was right. We owned the compiler so I could turn off operator overloading. Okay? Turns out that all the hidden code that was generated was just too big and slow. Okay? And we did not want people to actually go and, and see how, you know, when you're running a new shell and you, and it, you can actually watch every line be, draw, be drawn in your shell, this is not good. Even though the lines are beautiful, every, every icon is beautiful, if you can watch them being drawn, it's not a good experience. Computers are supposed to do things quickly, okay? And if you start noticing lags, okay, in communication or in, in UI responsiveness, this is going to impact your customer's perception of the product, okay? And customer's perception of your product being, being powerful. Power, powerful is usually not slow. Powerful is fast. Customer perception is critically important, okay? So from, for the, within the, the narrow confines of development, okay, these rules are important here for for, for what you're doing. It's, you have to think about efficiency at all times. You have to live and breathe efi efficiency. This is completely true not, not only for in compiled languages like C and C++, but also for interpreted languages, you know, Ruby, uh, PHP, et cetera. You have to think efficiency at every, every point. So we started development in earnest on Cairo, and we had a plan a plan for maximal efficiency in how we were going to design and how each of these piece components were going to work. Okay? We wanted to have complete flexibility and, and rely, have each component rely on each other through some reasonably good high bandwidth interfaces. Okay? So we had a file system, a Kerberos uh, directory uh, service, and a distributed file system. Each was extensible. Each had, like I said, these well-designed APIs. But it turns out there was one problem, okay, one problem that was exceedingly difficult, okay? To find Kerberos, the security service, okay, we needed to talk to the directory service. To talk to, to talk to the directory service in a secure way, you needed to talk to Kerberos for, for authentication. Starting the distributed file system required loading configuration from the directory service in a secure manner. Directory service stored its, its information in the object database, the object store. Okay, making very heavy use of the query capabilities of the object store. Kerberos stored its data in the object file store, but used the DFS namespace. Opening files or getting access to objects in the, in the, in the object file store, this required uh, security checks and it had to map user-friendly names for who owns it or who, who is currently accessing the computer, mapping these security principles out to something that is computable uh, for, for the, uh, for the uh, authentication service. This required using the directory service, okay? Um, technologies are not a product. Understand the difference between a bag of features and what a product is. Um, okay, so to, ra to wrap this up, what is success? Everything that I've been talking about is success, okay? What is success for you, okay? These are, these are examples of great success, okay? But these are all sort of second order things. I think success for me as, as, at Microsoft has always been about delivering high quality, cool function on time. Every, every piece, every bit, bit of work you do in terms of talking to customers, designing your products, testing it, figuring out what you're gonna do in the future, everything needs to be in service of one of these items here, okay? Because if you, if you uh, 
Um, if you don't do this, your product is not going to be nearly as good as successful as, as it could be. Okay. Thank you.